Yes, I, I never used from the very beginning uh, the concept of uh, spring and even revolution. Because revolution means for me much more than what we are witnessing. And this is what I was saying at the beginning. And I think that uh, up to now, unfortunately, I was more right than wrong with what we are now seeing on the ground in Egypt and in Tunisia. What we were expecting and, and talking about, you know, this movement in MENA, uh, North African country in the Middle East, changing everything, it's not happening. More than that, what I was saying also after studying the fact is that all this perception that nothing was known by the West and it came all of a sudden out of nothing or economic or social economic problems, this was not true. Uh, we have facts now, and they are confirmed also with what is happening in Syria. That Freedom House, Albert Einstein Institute, the State Department in the, in, in, in the States, but also many institutions and transnational institutions, and Google themselves, they train people to push towards the, uh, what they were calling democratizing the Middle East. And they didn't take seriously George W. Bush when he said it in 2006. He said it. So here we have people pushing and states pushing. And we have to ask ourselves why. Because they were controlling the dictators before, controlling Ben Ali, Mubarak, and even dealing with uh, Qaddafi because he came back into the international scene. And in fact, the problem that we had from the beginning is that we were thinking in political terms, not in geostrategic and economic terms. Because for the states as well as for Europe, they were losing ground in the region with the new, the presence of new actors. Among them, the Greek countries, as we know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, add to this Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, and Turkey are new players in the country, in the region. <coughs> so I think that if we look at the political uh, dimensions, we are misled. And if you look now at what is happening in Egypt and now at what is happening in Tunisia, you can get it. But in fact, it's not about the political structure. Tunisia is in an, assi an assisted economy now. It's just um, impossible for Tunisia to survive if they don't have the support of the Western countries, and especially World Bank and the IMF. Exactly the same with Egypt. So all this discussion about the state, the nature of the state, not getting, for example, with the discussion with the new constitution in Egypt, that what is the more important thing is the economic sector, with also the new role for the, the army within the civil state. And this has to do with geostrategy. So the whole process is far from being, you know, revolutionary. Uh, it's a new positioning. Uh, now, to say everything was manipulated, no, but it was pushed. And what we can see is that no one was expecting the Syrian citizens to be so courageous and to take to the street. This is why for eight months, the American administration and the European administration were asking Bashar al-Assad to reform. And even the Turkish prime minister was hoping that it will be a reform from within up to the point that they realized it's not going to happen and the people were ready to die. So what is not manipulated is the awakening, the intellectual awakening, the sense for the people that we can remove a dictator. And this is irreversible. This is what is gained from the whole process. But this kind of romanticized you know, way of dealing with revolutions and the spring, where is the spring? Which country is succeeding today? Tunisia is destabilized. Uh, Libya is fractured. Uh, uh, Egypt is unsettled. Syria is a civil war. Yemen, there are tensions and sectarian uh, realities. Jordan is unstable. Where is the spring we are talking about? Thank you. It's clear that uh, in the streets and taking uh, to the streets in Medan Tahrir in Egypt or in Tunisia, there were a great deal of women involved. And even if you look at what was happening in, you know, the first country where we had this kind of internet and, you know, social networks was Iran. And the women were very much involved. So it's clear now with this mobilization with Asma, who was told in Egypt 
don't go to Midan and Tahrir on the 25th of January. And she said, uh, she was told, don't go, you are a woman. And, and she responded by saying, I'm a woman, so show me if you are a man, you come and you join me. Meaning by this, she was ready for, for the fight and, and she was ready for... And I think that there is an awareness here that the driving force, one of the driving forces within the whole process was the presence of women. And this is very important. Now, does it mean, you know, to, to have a, a resistance uh, uh, a process as we had with women being involved is one thing. It's another thing to look at what can come afterward with the presence of women in building the country. And if you look at uh, uh, Tunisia, for example, it's still marginal, the role of women. It's very marginal in Egypt. It's still a very male, fast uprising process. It's a male uh, dimension. Uh, uh, and, and we also have to ask ourselves, because the West is portraying, it, it, they are doing now what they did also with, uh, with Turkey after Erdogan took over and say, saying, oh, the country is going to be Islamized, and you will see headscarves everywhere. So for them, headscarves mean Islamization. Islamization means less right for women. And my answer to this is completely opposite, is to say, you are not free depending on the way you dress. You are free on two conditions. First is access to education. Are the women as educated, or are they access to education as men have? In North African countries, not the case. You, for example, in Turkey, it's now a reality that the more educated women, and they are doing better than men, by being as educated and better educated. Now, in, in North African countries, it's not the case. In the Middle East, it's not the case. Even though, for example, in Iran, after 30 years of this revolution, you can agree or not with the revolution, but you cannot deny the fact that the women are much more involved in the public sphere, in the political landscape, and they are very much educated. What is missing, and this is the second point on which, uh, uh, the second parameter on which we can uh, evaluate uh, if we are dealing with empowering women, yes or no, is the access to the job market. And the access to the job market is, is essential because this is where you get your social recognition, your financial autonomy, and something which is your freedom. This is why you get freedom. If you look at all what is happening now after the uprisings, it is not there. It's not enough there. We don't have a policy based on uh, liberating from political oppression and emancipating from male discrimination. Uh, so, so we still, uh, it's, a, it's positive as a process is not achieved as uh, a project. You know, this is the, the, the very old rhetoric coming from the dictators and coming from uh, uh, Western administrations saying, look, we better go with dictators, because if we don't have the dictators, we'll have worse than them. And worse than them means Islamists, and dogmatic Islamists, and people who are completely closed and not Democrats. This is the, the, the rhetoric that we have for 40 years. It was said in Egypt, Mubarak was saying, if it's not me, it's going to be the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood are not moderate, because there is nothing like moderate Islamists. Mother Islamist is a contradiction in terms. This is what he was selling, and very quickly <coughs> this was bought by the West and promoted as such, and exactly the same with Ben Ali in, in Tunisia. Now what we can see, and this is something also which is very important, is that the, 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 the counter power coming even from the Islamists are not uh, 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 autocrats, and they are not tyrants, and they are not dictators. It doesn't mean, because you are not dictators, that you are uh, now uh, ready to deal with a democratic process. It's a long, uh, and, and you also, it's a, it's a very long process, and you have to take into account the conflicting forces within the society. Look at what is happening in Tunisia and in Egypt, where you have uh, the Islamists in Nahda, or the Muslim Brotherhood, you have the Salafi, and the Salafi are also pushed, and these are the literally Salafi, and you have the jihadists as well, going towards, you know, more violence. You have the secularists that are pushing in one direction, and you have the army. So the country is just the forces and the political forces are scattered in a way. So so what the, the risk is not, uh, because there is this popular awareness that they don't want dictators again, but uh, it's scattered.
they were united again, they are scattered for what they want afterwards. And there are political forces that are playing from within, as well as also pushed from outside. Who is pushing in that direction to make this region remaining very fragile? At the end of the day, the reality of the Middle East today is that uh, the spring that we were uh, announcing ended up being uh, a, a very fragile uh, uh, Middle East and North African mm -hmm. countries for the sake of whom? There is something that happens, is that the political structures are shaken and the economic market is open, much more open than what we thought. And it might be this is the point of the whole process. Here, I don't think that the West is caring about democracy. It's caring about interest and market. So if not the first countries to be liberated should be the petro monarchies because this is where the people are not, are not experiencing democracy and money is there. They don't care about that. Uh, so there are, uh, there is a, a, a way of reading the prism through which we have to read this is twofold. And I kept on repeating this in the book and also in an uh, article that I, I, I wrote afterwards is we should not blame the West for everything but we should not be naive with the West in the whole process. You know, we should not buy very quickly that the West is for democracy. On the other side, the first to be blamed also in the whole uh, uh, dynamic is, is also the, the political leaders and the intellectuals in the Arab world that are not showing you know, leadership as to what do we want. It's, it's polarizing the debates between secularists and Islamists. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about the, the real issues, and that's problematic. Once again, we cannot deny the fact that it's there. You know, when I was talking to people on Anar, I was in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Or even when I came to, to Turkey, very often Turkish people or Tunisian people or even Egyptian people are saying, oh, the West is portraying us into two groups, the secularists versus the Islamists. I'm sorry, it's not only the West that is doing this. You yourself are doing it, because this is the way you go in, in, in Turkey and you have tensions between the two groups, exactly the same as the elite in Tunisia or in Egypt. Everywhere now we have this. And so we cannot deny this. Now, not to deny this reality doesn't mean that we accept it as it is and we fall into the trap of this very simplistic uh, polarization of the political debate in the society. Because we end up having secularists saying to the Islamists, you are backward. You are the guardian of the tradition and you are not ready for democracy. This is a religious, you are theocrats. So they are pushing them in the, you know, the tradition and saying we are the progressive. On the other side, the, Muslim, the Islamists are saying to the secularists, you are uh, westernized and you are playing for uh, the game of the, 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 the foreign uh, uh, forces and we are the guardian of religion. And we end up having a political discussion between two groups Every one of, it, uh, of them is getting its justification by the presence of the other. But now it's coming with a policy, with a vision. So uh, I think that this is where uh, the current government in Turkey succeeded, by being very efficient and to go beyond this discussion. So at the end of the day, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is the economic success, the, the political success. And I would say that uh, uh, what is happening in Egypt and in Tunisia is still very far from that. We are in this type of polarization that is just uh, making the whole political discussion very sterile and, 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 and not very much uh, 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 tackling the, the issues that have to be tackled. So that, that's a, a good question. You had the, the, the personal advisor to Erdogan once, we were together in the Middle East, and he said, the question is not to ask if Muslims are ready for democracy or the Arabs are they ready for democracy. The question is to ask if uh, the West is ready for the, the, the Arabs to be democrats and to live with democracy. And it's a good question because uh, at the end, do we really want democracies and transparent democracies? Do, for example, the foreign countries, the great powers of today, uh, want democracy, are they ready for that? Uh, because they have been supporting dictators that were protecting their interests. What does it mean if we have true transparent democracies in the Middle East? No one can deny the fact that 80 to 90% of the people 
are not happy with the Israeli policy, that they were, are rejecting what the Israeli are doing, what they, they did in Gaza. What they, so there is a popular support towards the Palestinians. And they would not very, be very happy with the way the government and even, you know, Mubarak and Ben Ali were dealing with the issue. So, true democracies in the region would mean to question the Israeli policy and the way they are dealing with Palestinians. So this is why uh, uh, we have to differentiate between what would be the ideal democratic uh, state and what is the reality today is in fact in every country they are facing so many problems that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a secondary issue and they are not going to change anything. What you can hear now, coming from Morsi in, uh, and the, the, the leadership in Egypt, they don't want to touch the agreement. Tunisia exactly the same. And even in Turkey, we might say uh, it's good uh, because uh, Erdogan is taking symbolic uh, uh, positioning and, and having very strong statement about what... The, uh, but in, 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 in practical terms, this is not changing the reality of their relationship. It's just symbolic statements, and the Arabs are emotional, so they go for that. But this is not what we are talking about. We are talking about real policies that are supporting the rights of the Palestinians. And I would say transparent democracies would have helped what we have now with this very fragile situation in the Middle East. is very much helping the Israeli agenda as to carry on colonization, to deal with the divide between the Shia and the Sunni uh, in, in Syria, for example, with uh, uh, the fact that we have Syria, Iran, and Lebanon uh, isolated now, and in a situation of weakness. You don't have anything coming from the Sunni uh, countries that are could be of a support towards the Palestinians. So, and such a situation in, in uh, the Middle East divide between Shia and Sunni, and then economic weakness that needs the support <coughs> of the uh, Bretton Woods institution. What, we, what can you expect more than that for the Israeli project in the region? And it might be that uh, we are thinking the wrong way if we think that uh, Israel is not happy with what is happening. I don't think that there is a relationship between Salafism and, and literalism and extremism in Iran. Mm -hmm. I think that Iran now is in the middle of this fracture between Sunni and Shia. By the way, for example, they are supporting Bashar al-Assad. Mm -hmm. and, and they, th So there is something. And, and the way also, you know, the petromonarchies in Saudi Arabia was even asking the Americans to, to deal with Iran, to cut the head of the snake as it was said by the King Abdullah. So, so it was very tough. So there is uh, 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 something at stake here that we have to, um, to, uh, to take into account. But I wouldn't say that this has an impact with, you know, the kind of uh, radicalization and violent extremism, because very often the Salafi that are pushed in that direction are mainly not coming from the Iranian uh, side of the, the, the equation, but the, the Salafi and the Sunni side of the equation, the great majority of the people who are radicalized mm -hmm. are, are very often coming from the Salafi, sometimes literalists and sometimes uh, 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 violent extremists. Mm -hmm. So so this is something which is going to be a challenge for the Sunni from within. How do we deal with the Salafi literalists and how do we deal with the jihadists, and, and we have a, a very important example, very, very uh, uh, dangerous situation in northern Mali, where you have these uh, Salafi jihadists that are now, uh, they took over uh, half of the country, and they are implementing, you know, the penal code, and, and, and in a way which is uh, unacceptable, this is not Islamic, it's not our religion. And yet, we still have to ask the, the, the true questions. How come every time we found resources, oil, gas, and uh, 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 wealth somewhere, you have the literalist radicals and extremists settling there? How come they arrived in, in Afghanistan, where we found lithium and gas and all this, and they are there? as if with their presence, they are justifying the presence 
of power that can take advantage of the situation. Northern Mali, we, uh, five years ago, we found oil resources that are as uh, uh, wealthy as the resources in Libya. And all of a sudden, we have radicals settling there. And, and, and there is a call now to intervene the Americans, the French, are ready to do this. We have to be a bit uh, cautious and not to be naive. We have violent extremist Muslims. Yes, we have them. But sometimes they are instrumentalized for something which is bigger than them. And we have also to be uh, to get that right. I have been following the situation in Turkey for the last 20 years. You know, even before that, with the first trend of, you know, the resistance with uh, Erbakan and his vision of a political economic resistance with the DR, DH that he wanted to create. Uh, and then uh, uh, Erdogan came, and, and there is a gap between what he's doing now and what was done before. Uh, and then there is a point which is important, that he has been very successful on three fields. The first one is to be able to uh, uh, act against corruption and to try to have more transparent political processes within society. And this is true. It's not perfect. And still, we have a lot to do in Turkey. And, and uh, even for what uh, is uh, uh, related to freedom, we still have to deal with some of these issues. But there is a trend here which is important. The second is the way uh, the current government dealt with the army. In fact, all this discussion with the EU, to integrate EU and to be part of the EU, was very smart, because this is from where they were able to say to the army, if you stay where you are, we are not able to enter. So in EU standards, your position is problematic. So it was playing against the army that was advocating uh, the secular by saying the secular that is advocated by the EU is not the secular system advocated by the army. So you better find the right place. So this is something that happened over the last seven years that is very important because this is where the country is moving towards something which is a true democratic process and not a democratic process under the, the, the authority of the army as a guardian. That's not a democratic process. When the army is protecting democracy, it's a problem. So the third thing is in economic terms, and this is where uh, I think uh, uh, the Turkish model was successful. They are winning the election because they are successful in economic terms, and they are making much better even than the great majority, if not all the European countries. Having said that, uh, we have to compare uh, the like with the like. What Egypt is experiencing now, or Tunisia, they don't have the same assets, and they don't have the same history, and they don't have the same uh, potential. So what is a model is with people saying, we have an Islamic reference, but we have now to open up what is the Islamic reference, to understand with whom we are playing, is to understand the environment. So this is good. This is a good question, and this is a good way to put it. Now, the choices that are made within the society as to what are the priorities, the choices to be integrated into the international global uh, economic order, this could be disputable. I would dispute this by saying which type of alternative are you proposing? And, and the Turkish uh, uh, on this are not very much proposing something, except that what I saw over the last few years, it's interesting, this uh, shift towards the south and east opening embassies in, in Africa, opening uh, uh, channels with China, India, Malaysia. Now, it's quite interesting. So I wouldn't judge too quickly, but uh, uh, I think we still have to remain critical uh, of the Turkish uh, uh, experience in a positive way, in a constructive way, not as denying that nothing was, no, many things have been done right and good. Uh, but uh, the future of uh, uh, ethics in politics is not to fall into the trap of competing with uh, the global economy as if this is the, 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 the right thing to do. And the second is not to buy the security measures that are imposed by the West as being ours and everything which has to do with NATO 
and we have to do with the way we deal with security could be problematic. And the last point is beyond the symbolic attitude towards Israel, what is really done by Turkey to help uh, this conflict to be solved. I, I think it's it's a, a revealing uh, reality, the fact that uh, um, the EU is refusing to integrate Turkey reveals lots of things. First, it's clear that uh, they have an economic concern by saying, you know, it's, there are millions of Turkish people who can come and it's going to be unbalanced as to the reality of the cultural relationship within Turkey, within Euro the European Union. The second is about the perception that Islam is not a European religion and Turks are mainly Muslims. So it's a uh, welcoming and alien element within the European continent. So it's revealing the narrative. The European narrative was not, is not today, uh, encompassing the Turkish factor or the Turkish element. Uh, and the Islamic one is also something which uh, uh, has to do with uh, uh, a problem here in the way uh, uh, Islam is perceived as a non-European religion. So, so we have to, to, to be very, very deep in this uh, uh, analysis, uh, how mm, the Turkish experience, how the Turkish memorial, how the Turkish history, how the Turkish landscape as to the religions uh, is part of Europe. And this is where the Turkish intellectuals, the Turkish politicians, uh, the Turkish journalists should be much more assertive as to the European dimension of this experience. It's not done enough. It's, it's very much done in economic terms in to integrate EU. But EU, it's, uh, it's, not the, 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 it's not representing the fundamentals of the European experience. It's just a structure, which, by the way, is not really democratic. It's not. So it's you know deputies, parliamentaries that are making decisions far from the people. The great majority of the Europeans are not happy with EU as a structure. They say, who is deciding for whom? Yeah. So it might be that uh, uh, the Turkey should talk more to people than to institutions. That's a very important point. Talk to the people, because the people can get you much more than if you only talk to the structures. The structures are based on all what I said now, which is problematic. This situation needs uh, to be tackled and, and an answer. And I think that uh, beyond the Turkish emotions, whereas, you know, Tur you know it's, there is something in the history, in the memory of the, the, the Turkish nation, which has to do with, it's not the same, but there is something which is a very quick emotional reaction when we speak about Armenia and when we speak about the, Tur the Kurds. It's as if, oh, something is at stake here, it's a danger. Uh, it is dangerous if we keep on uh, tackling it in emotional terms. Now, we should deal with it in political terms. There are rights and there are minorities, and, and we know that some are acting to divide and, and pushing to divide. That's, that's clear. We know that there are forces, they want to divide, and there are claims uh, that are not very sincere in political terms. That's, that's the situation. But if we want to solve the problem, we should be clear and consistent with our principles. Freedom of expression, the freedom of minorities to be, to be accepted and respected within the society. This is, uh, these are things that are, should be much more open as to space where uh, the current Turkish government should be more consistent. The, 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 Tur the current Turkish government is doing very well on many issues, but still we are expecting from this government to be consistent when it comes to dealing with minorities, to be consistent when it comes to uh, 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 transition, political transition. And as, you know, I keep on repeating this and telling them, you know what, you said to the world, you should leave, you should learn to leave. And I repeat it to the Turkish people. It's good to be elected, it's good to run the country when you are elected, but history should learn, should, should teach you, you should learn to leave even if you are successful. And part of your success is to leave at the right time and not to stay too long.